Sexual Rejuvenation by Professor Brown Sicard From paper read to the Société de Biologie, June 21st, 1889 The effects produced in man by subcutaneous injections of a liquid obtained from the testicles of animal Professor Brown Sicard, the father of endocrinology, was without doubt one of the most brilliant scientific minds of modern times. To him, we owe the brilliant concept of internal secretion, which has revolutionized physiology and has led to the birth of the new science of endocrinology. In 1864, Brown Sicard was appointed Professor of Physiology and Pathology of the Nervous System at Harvard University. In 1869, he became Professor of Experimental and Comparative Physiology at the École de Médecine, and in 1878, he became Professor of Physiology at the College of France. In 1889, he conducted his remarkable experiments on the administration of testicular extracts, the results of which were communicated to the Société de Biologie June 1, 1889, in two notes on the results of the hypodermic injection in man of testicular juices from monkeys and dogs, and certain generalizations deduced therefrom. Such juices, he said, had a definite energy mobilizing, or, as he put it, dynamogenic action upon the subject, stimulating it amazingly his general health, muscular power, and mental activity. The following is from a second paper read before the Societe de Biologie, which appeared in its Transactions for June 21st, 1889. There is no need of describing at length the great effects produced on the organization of man by castration when it is made before the adult age. It is particularly well known that eunuchs are characterized by their general debility and their lack of intellectual and physical activity. There is no medical man who does not know how much the mind and body of man, especially before the spermatic glands have acquired their full power, or when that power is declining in consequence of advancing age, are affected by sexual abuse or by masturbation. Besides, it is well known that seminal losses arising from any cause produce a mental and physical debility which is in proportion to their frequency. These factors, and many others, have led to the generally admitted view that within the seminal fluid, as secreted by the testicles, a substance of several substances exist, which, entering the blood by resorption, have a most essential use in giving strength to the nervous system and to other parts. But, if what may be called spermatic aninus leads to that conclusion, the opposite state, which can be named spermatic plethora, gives a strong testimony in favour of that conclusion. It is well known that well-organised men, especially from 20 to 35 years of age, who remain absolutely free from sexual intercourse or any other cause of expenditure of seminal fluid, are in a state of excitement, giving them a great, although abnormal, physical and mental activity. These two series of facts contribute to show what great dynamogenic power is possessed by some substance or substances which our blood owes to the testicles. Leaving aside, and for future researchers, the questions relating to the substance or substances which, being formed by the testicles, gives power to the nervous centres and various other parts, I have made use, in subcutaneous injections, of a liquid containing a very small quantity of water mixed with the three following substances. First, blood of the testicular veins, secondly, semen, and, thirdly, juice extracted from a testicle crushed immediately after it has been taken from a dog or a guinea pig. I have hitherto made ten subcutaneous injections of such a liquid, two in my left arm, all the others in my lower limbs, from May 15th to June 4th last. The first five injections were made on May 24th, 29th, and 30th, and June 4th, the liquid used came from guinea pigs. Coming now to the favourable effects of these injections, I beg to be excused for speaking so much as I shall do of my own person. I am 72 years old. My general strength, which has been considerable, has notably and gradually diminished during the last 10 or 12 years. Before May 15th last, I was so weak that I was always compelled to sit down after an hour's work in a laboratory. Even when I remained seated all the time, or almost all the time, in the laboratory, 
I used to come out of it quite exhausted after three or four hours' experimental labour, and sometimes after only two hours. For many years, on returning home in a carriage at six o'clock, after several hours passed in the laboratory, I was so extremely tired that I invariably had to go to bed after having hastily taken a small amount of food. Very frequently, the exhaustion was so great that although extremely sleepy, I could not for hours go to sleep, and I only slept very little, waking up exceedingly tired. The day after the first subcutaneous injection, and still more after the two succeeding ones, a radical change took place in me, and I had ample reason to say, and to write, that I regained at least all the strength I possessed a good many years ago. Considerable laboratory work hardly tired me. To the great astonishment of my two principal assistants, doctors Darsonval and Chanwick, and other persons, I was able to make experiments for several hours while standing up, feeling no need whatever to sit down. Still more, one day, the 23rd of May, after three hours and a quarter of hard experimental labour in the standing position, I went home so little tired that, after dinner, I was able to go to work and to write for an hour and a half a part of a paper on a difficult subject. For more than twenty years, I had never been able to do as much. My friends know that owing to certain circumstances and certain habits, I have, for thirty or forty years, gone to bed very early and done my writing in the morning, beginning it generally between three and four o'clock. For a great many years, I had lost all power of doing any serious mental work. Since my first subcutaneous injection, I have very frequently been able to do such work, two, three, and one evening for nearly four hours. From a natural impetuosity, and also to avoid losing time, I had, till I was sixty years old, the habit of ascending and descending stairs so rapidly that my movements were rather those of running than of walking. This had gradually changed, and I had come to move slowly up and down the stairs, having to hold to the banister in difficult staircases. After the second injection, I found that I had fully regained my old powers and returned to my previous habits in that respect. My limbs, tested with a dynamometer for a week before my trials and during the month following the first injection, showed a decided gain of strength. The average number of kilograms moved by the flexors of the right forearm before the first injection was about 34 and a half, from 32 to 37, and after that injection, 41, from 39 to 44, the gain being from 6 to 7 kilograms. In that respect, the forearm flexors reacquired, in the great measure, the strength they had when I was living in London, more than 26 years ago. The average number of kilograms moved by those muscles in London in 1863 was 43, 40 to 46 kilograms. With regard to the facility of intellectual labour, which had diminished within the last few years, a return to my previous ordinary condition became quite manifest during and after the first two or three days of my experiments. It is evident from these facts, and from some others, that all the functions depending on the power of action of the nervous centres, and especially of the spinal cord, were notably and rapidly improved by the injections I have used. My first communication to the Paris Biological Society was made with the wish that other medical men would make on themselves experiments similar to mine, so as to ascertain, as I then stated, if the effect I had observed depended or not on any special idiosyncrasy, or a kind of autosuggestion without hypnotization, due to the conviction which I had before experimenting that I shall surely obtain a great part at least of these effects. Without asking my advice, Dr. Variot, a physician who believed that the subcutaneous injection of a spermatic fluid could do no harm, has made a trial of that method on three old men, one fifty-four, another fifty-six, and the third sixty-eight years old. On each of them, the effects have been found to be very nearly the same as those I have obtained on myself. Dr. Variot made use of the testicles of rabbits and guinea pigs. I received a letter from Dr. Variot announcing that, after injecting the liquid drawn from the testicles into these individuals, he had obtained the same strengthening effects I have myself experienced. I believe that, after the results of Dr. Variot's trials, it is hardly possible to explain the effects I have observed on myself otherwise than admitting that the liquid injected possesses the power of increasing the strength of many parts of the human organism. 
and he's hardly saying that those effects cannot have been due to structural changes, and that they resulted only from nutritive modifications, perhaps in a very great measure from purely dynamical influences exerted by some of the principles contained in the injected fluid. To the above, by way of supplement, are to be added the following translations of passages from the earlier Paris announcements. Not only is there nothing to be astonished at in the fact that the introduction into the blood of principles taken from the testicles of young animals is followed by an augmentation of vigour, but this result is even to be expected. In fact, everything shows that the force of the spinal marrow, and also, though to a lesser degree, that of the brain, has, in adult or aged men, fluctuations connected with the functional activity of the testicles. To the fact which I mentioned in the communication at the sitting of the 1st of June, I believe I ought to add that the following particulars have been observed a great number of times in the course of several years in the case of two persons aged from 55 years to 50. At my advice, each time that they had a great piece of work, either physical or intellectual, to accomplish, they put themselves into a state of active sexual excitement, avoiding, however, all seminal ejaculation. The glands of the testicles then temporarily acquired great functional activity which was soon followed by the desired augmentation of power in the nervous centres. An article, The Rationale of the brown Sicard Treatment, The Medical Age, August 26, 1889, speaking of the seminal fluid, says, That it wastes or departs from the system in diseased conditions is shown by the quotations from Landois and Sterling, and the same conditions are partly responsible for the debility of old age. That it wastes or departs from the system in diseased conditions is shown by the quotation from Landois and Sterling, and the same conditions are partly responsible for the debility of old age. It is, of course, rather early to speculate on its mode of action, but enough has been ascertained to point out the proper line of research. Whether it be simply a nerve stimulant, or whether it has a direct influence on the organised elements, corpuscles, of the blood itself, of a revivifying or energising nature, will in due course be determined. The very fact that it is wasted or excreted in diseased conditions, characterised by important lesions, is a strong corroborative element of our syllogism. On healthy individuals, the substance seems to act simply as an exhilarant or stimulant to the nervous system. In The Elixir of Life, by Dunbar, an exposition of Brown Sicard's physiological discovery regarding the possibility of rejuvenation through testicular extracts, we read Why do all animals that are continent display excessive energy? Why does excessive indulgence, or loss of the seminal fluid, invariably weaken the animal? Why is a larger quantity of spermine contained in the generative parts and nervous system? Why is a larger quantity of spermine contained in the generative parts and nervous system than in other organs of the body? Why is this substance found in the sputum of detritus of wasting structures? Why do such marked tonic results follow its replacement? Why do certain kinds of food material, now known to contain this principle, act as decided stimulants, and the evidence of which is usually first discerned in the condition of the generative apparatus? Dr. Saccard nowhere heralds an elixir of life, fountain of youth, or other such nonsense, and this likening to Ponce de Leon is simply an emanation of the reportorial brain. His statements made before the Societe de Biologie is simply to the effect that, in his own case, and in experiments conducted more or less continuously since 1869, he had reason to believe a discovery had been made of a new nerve stimulant, concealed or contained in the spermatic secretion, that its influence is chiefly expended upon the exhausted nervous system. In fact, it relates to the most sacred portions of the animal economy, and that the abuse of these organs by man is such as to bring not only them, but their possessors, in moral disrepute, seems to tempt popular and vulgar levity. The claims, however, are not altogether new to the world, presumably. We now have every reason to believe that the ancient civilizations, Chaldea, Egypt, and Ethiopia, for instance, forgot more of pathology and physiology than we yet know. Among these ancient peoples, there was a strong veneration for the sexual apparatus as the origin of life, which underlay their worship 
and yet survives esoterically to every known religion of the world, Christianity included. Today, the phallic and yoni emblems appertain to the worship of the Nazarenes and his virgin mother. We find the same reverence vulgarised, yet plainly patent in the Middle Ages, also that the generative organs and the productions from the earliest times to the present were regarded as furnishing potent remedies for diseases of a certain class. Again, it is an indisputable fact that genital affections of all classes are accompanied by pallor, wasting and general exhaustion of the central nervous system. The wasting diseases of the female organism, notably leucoria, are as positive in these effects as the excessive loss of semen or a violent urethritis in the male. Dr. Loomis, writing in the New York Medical Report, August 24th, 1889, reports from his practice 10 cases treated by injection of testicular fluid as follows. The fluid exhibits upon the nerve centres some potent, but as yet not understood, influence, which may in time prove to be beneficial in some cases, but necessitates cautious use in others. Its affections upon old men seem to be an augmentation of vigour and vitality, certainly continuing several days. It does produce nutritive modification in the tissues of elderly men, through the medium probably of stimulation of the nerve centres. In an article, The Testicle as a Rejuvenator, Boston Medical and Surgical Journal, July 11th, 1889, we read, Twenty years ago, at least, Dr. Brown Sicard exhibited tendencies towards a belief that the testicles might be of value for other purposes than the impregnation of the ovum, provided it was taken when young, that it was competent when its vital principles were properly injected for the respective purposes, not only to call into existence the very young, but to rejuvenate the aged.